All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today there are six updates. A few of them are news, some of them are studies, and one of them is a mechanism as well. These are the, the topics that Cool Beans had been asking for, and uh, some of them actually are here. John, uh, thank you very much for your links. They are really, really helpful. So let's start with our discussion. I think you would be You'll be very happy with the discussion today. Uh, so let's start. A disclosure, none. This is the objective. This is what we're going to talk about. So first study. This is a study that cross-reactive CD4 T cells. And I'll explain what these are. Cross-reactive CD4 T cells enhance SARS-CoV-2 immune response upon infection and vaccination. So very quickly, the links so here are the links this is drbean.com this is the study that i'm just going to talk about then this is the second study that i would talk about this is the uh, anti sars cov 2 receptor binding domain antibody evolution so we'll give two three minutes for each of these topics then there is merck related news then there is scandinavian countries sweden finland denmark uh, pausing or limiting Mer uh, moderna's use then we'll talk about Quercetin and thyroid, that is a discussion that has been requested for some time. So let's start. So this is the first one. Cross-reactive CD4 T cells enhance SARS-CoV-2 immune response. So what does this mean? This simply means, let's take this a basic idea. According to this study, if somebody had human coronavirus infection, and human coronaviruses are mostly present in about 84% of us. On the yearly basis, the common cold-like symptoms that we develop, many of us would develop them in the winter now. About 10 to 15% of those infections are because of human coronaviruses. The study says those who had a recent human coronavirus infection, they actually have less severe SARS-CoV-2 if SARS-CoV-2 occurs as well. And those who have cells against human coronaviruses present in our memory pool, you know that when in, an infection occurs, then we form a memory pool for that infection. If we have the T cells against human coronaviruses, then we respond better to SARS-CoV-2 as well. And the third important point they make, and this is a fascinating study, we should all read it. I'm summarizing it. The third important point they make is this. As we age, as we spend more time with the human coronaviruses, as we are exposed more and more often with them, our immune system becomes less and less reactive to them. This is called immune senescence or the aging of the immune system. It is generally tolerance of our immune system to say, hey, I see this thing again and again. It doesn't do really much to me. So I'm not going to bother fighting it every single moment. So as we age, for example, I am in now 50s, then my T cells that would react to human coronaviruses are less active and less in number. Because of that, if I get SARS-CoV-2 today, my human coronavirus cross reaction to SARS-CoV-2 will be less. My immune system will attack SARS-CoV-2 with less intensity. And that is why SARS-CoV-2 can become severe in people with advanced age. This is the basic mechanism. I love this study. Uh, how much is this actually on point? How prevalent is this uh, situation? I think there'll be more studies, but what they're telling is they know why some people become severe, especially those who are in advanced age. And the reason for that is their immune system does not 
care for the human coronavirus reaction. And because of that, they do not have potent immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Now let's see this in the, uh, I'll show you this cartoon in a second. So let's see this in my drawings. So I have started back on my illustrations. So here we are. So the first one, what are they talking about in this study? Once again, I'm going to summarize it. So let's say this is a human coronavirus. Human coronaviruses have spike proteins that are very similar to SARS-CoV-2. And of course, human coronaviruses also have spike proteins with S1 portion, that is this part, and S2 portion. Good. Here is the SARS-CoV-2, the more dangerous one, the more the killer one. Of course, it also has a spike protein with S1 and S2. Researchers have found that if we, you, me, somebody else, if they have immune response for S2 part of the spike protein for human coronavirus, then they respond to SARS-CoV-2, the previous was SARS-CoV-1, they respond to SARS-CoV-2 with better potency, reducing the severity. They also found that if we have immune response that is targeted to human coronavirus S1 part, then somehow that does not offer good potent response for S2, for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And that may be because the S1 of the human coronavirus and S1 of SARS-CoV-2 are kind of mutated and different. Okay, then continuing. What are the cells that they are implicating? Which cells are helping? So this is my uh, usual regular uh, immune system diagram. So here is the innate arm. So let's say this is a dendritic cell. This cell got the SARS-CoV-2 in it. Previously it had SARS-CoV-1, for example. Let's say this was, or it was exposed, my immune system, let's say this is mine, was exposed to human coronavirus. If now there is SARS-CoV-2 and that SARS-CoV-2's S2 part of the spike protein, S2 part, S2 part of the spike protein is presented as an antigen to naive T cells, to a person who was already exposed to human coronavirus or H coves, then that person would respond better. And we know that the response are of two types, T helper one response, which would then create antibodies or T helper two type response. I, I'm speaking the other way around. T helper two making antibodies, T helper one making cytotoxic system. They are talking about these helper cells. They're saying if we have these helper cells against human coronavirus, then we respond better to SARS-CoV-2, the intensity is less. Beautiful, beautiful study. Now they also found, and, and this is called cross-reactivity, that we are reacting to one pathogen and the learning from there is used to react to another pathogen. This is called cross-reactivity. And coronavirus's cross-reactivity is possible. Now the question that why youngsters respond less with less symptoms, with better control compared to not so young folks. So the response to that, the, they say in their study, is that youngsters have an immune system that is getting to know these viruses and these pathogens and infection more recently. So their system is more active. It is more young. It is more functional. So youngsters, when they are exposed to SARS-CoV-2, and if they had previously been exposed to SARS-CoV, SARS, sorry, not even SARS, human coronavirus, then they respond better because of the cross-reaction. In older age, this cross-reactivity reduces. So I said two minutes, I have taken nine minutes on this talk, but I think this is a fascinating talk. What this means, look at this, 
cartoon. I just made this cartoon before this one. So the, there's a shopkeeper standing here, sitting here, whatever, leaning on the counter saying, sorry, out of stock for H. Cove saliva. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, let's continue. Study number two. Anti-SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain antibody evolution after messenger RNA vaccination. This is John who shared this on Discord. And John, thank you very much. Beautiful study. So here is what the study says. So once again, let me just tell you what the study says and then we'll look at it. The study is saying, if somebody is infected with SARS-CoV-2 and recovered, and then if they receive vaccine, their response or their buildup of antibodies is better compared to somebody who has only gotten the vaccines. So there is a danger in this study's interpretation and I would like us to be on the same page. This does not mean we should go try to get infected. Infection is dangerous, it can kill us. So we should try to be as much protecting as we can. This also does not mean that one should say, you know what, I need to have infection as part of my protection. This is an observation they made on people who accidentally became infected and then they got vaccinated and then they are looking at their mechanism that how are their vaccines working. So in this one, so let's see. I'm going to continue here. The basic mechanism is affinity maturation. And uh, as you can tell, I'm trying to figure out how do I do um, better drawings. So this mechanism that you're seeing here, this happens in a lymph node. In a lymph node, what happens is, there is blood that is coming in, then there, then there is lymph. Lymph is the fluids from the tissues that is coming in, that are coming in. Of course, when the, when the fluids are coming in, there are macrophages that run to the lymph node and they have captured an antigen, for example, let's say SARS-CoV-2. There are broken pieces of SARS-CoV-2 that would come in of other viruses, pathogens, broken tissue. There are neutrophil that are going to be killing the pathogen and releasing those those antigens and they are flowing into the lymph node. Lymph node is continuously receiving the trash that is flowing in our tissues, plus active policemen, the cops, the antigen presenting cells, for example, dendritic cells, macrophages, they are running to the lymph node as well and saying, I captured this guy, I captured this criminal, I captured that antigen. Then inside the lymph node, they present those antigens to B cells, T cells. We see the, the diagram before how that whole mechanism works in NATO adaptive arm. But then the presence of antigen causes another mechanism to occur inside the lymph node, which is that there are a special kind of cells. These are called follicular dendritic cell. <laughs> So I just, Alquin said, it's a picture of Alquin presenting flowers to Priya. Not good, Alquin. Uh, John Sonata says it's a dendritic and a B cell. Correct. So this is a special kind of dendritic cell. It is called a follicular dendritic cell. Follicular dendritic cells live in the lymph node. Their function is to pick up the antigens that are brought in and then present to the B cells that those B cells that have already aware of how to attack a specific antigen. So for example, in case of SARS-CoV-2, when future SARS-CoV-2 pieces, broken parts, spike proteins, broken parts, when they flow in the lymph node and, or when they're brought in by macrophages or other cells, follicular dendritic cells are going to pick those pieces up like small flowers and they would go to the B cells and they would try to present it to every B cell. This is like a lover or a romantic boy who's trying to just go to any girl and say, I'm going to offer you a flower and then try to become friends with her. And not everyone is going to say yes. So those B cells that know how to bind with this antigen, who have binding sites for this one, 
they would bind with this antigen. And when they bind with this antigen, they will not become active. They would not start making a, a ruckus over there. They're not going to start hurting things. They are going to start refining their binding site manufacturing to have a better and a better fit. We talked about that yesterday as well, that if you have a wrench and you are using that wrench to kind of make a better you know, fit with whatever you are tightening, that is what happens here. This maturation of the B cell is called affinity maturation. B cells, when they are exposed to an antigen again and again, they become better and better at binding and killing with that one. And this is the process. The trainer is the follicular dendritic cell. Now, with this mechanism under our belt, the study says that if somebody gets a natural infection, somehow, now, there is a question in my mind which is not yet answered in that study. So I'm going to put that question to you as well so that uh, it, we are on the same page. The question is, why for a year SARS-CoV-2 antigens continue to be present? Because what they're saying is, from the day of the infection to about a year, the B cells that respond to SARS-CoV-2, they continue to become better and better in their antibody production to coronaviruses and their future attack on the coronaviruses will become better. So antibodies evolve. I guess this is the reason that somebody a few days ago had asked that hey, the antibodies would do hyper, uh, somatic hypermutation and anticipate the new, newer coronavirus mutations. So again, there is no anticipation here. It is just a refinement of the uh, B cells. And I said at that time as well that this was affinity maturation. So this is the affinity maturation that is happening. Now, if we go back to that study, the study says, very interesting study. They are saying that during this time, so when the infection has occurred, natural infection, during this time, memory B, and what is the time? A year after. During this time, memory B cells express increasingly broad and potent antibodies that are resistant to mutations found in variants of concern. As a result, vaccination of coronavirus disease, convalescent individuals, those who had the infection, then they recovered, then you give the vaccine, they, as a result, vaccination of coronavirus disease, convalescent individuals with currently available mRNA vaccines produce high level of plasma neutralizing activity against all variants. Now, I want to um, clarify one point over here. It is not that B cells are actually now anticipating all variants of the future. It is just that all variants are still coronavirus variants. They are not new strains. They are not heavily mutated away from the original parents. Because of that, a B cell that is doing affinity maturation will continue to attack and work on the variants in a normal way. Just like we saw in the previous study that human coronavirus-based T cells can attack SARS-CoV-2. Similarly here, a SARS-CoV-2 B cell will continue to attack newer variations as well because the variations have very tiny mutations. It is not that B cell has some, somehow found out where the mutations will be. But this is an interesting phenomenon. Then they say another thing which is very interesting, and that is here. For the vaccinated only, who didn't have an infection before, they just got vaccine. Just like, for example, I did not have an infection before and I got two uh, doses of Moderna. So what are they saying here? Individual memory antibodies selected over time by natural infection has greater potency and breadth than antibodies elicited by a vaccination. The overall neutralizing potency of plasma is greater following vaccination. So the overall neutralizing capability or the antibodies are more, plus they're more specific to the, to the uh, spike protein. Then they say these results suggest that boosting vaccinated individual with currently available mRNA vaccine will increase plasma neutralizing activity, but may not produce may not produce antibodies with equivalent breadth to those obtained by vaccinating convalescent individuals. 
and again this is not a new news from a mechanism point of view this is known and many of the cool beans have asked this question in the past and that is if somebody is exposed to a natural infection would they not have a more broad kind of antibodies that are attacking on their n n cap uh, n protein and m protein and spike protein and so on versus a set of antibodies produced only against the spike protein so yeah that is true and because of that, the potency is broader as well. So very interesting study. What is the takeaway of that? Uh, they're saying if somebody had infection and then vaccination is given, they develop a potent mature, mature antibody set. On the other hand, if somebody was just given the vaccinations, they do have great neutralizing capability as well, but they do not have such breadth as was with the natural infection and as was elevated by the vaccine's presence after the natural infection. Now, you may know that I always have said that natural infection and the vaccine, they should behave similarly. There is no one superior to the other. However, this mechanism makes sense. So if this is a mechanism, that means if somebody had the infection before, if they recovered fine, I actually don't think that they need a vaccine because they recovered fine. But if, let's say, they were at risk, they recovered once they needed help to recover, it may be useful to take the vaccine and that would improve their um, antibody set. So good, good um, study. John, thank you very much. Okay, so then let's continue. I do not know where my, <laughs> this OBS thing, I'm still not used to it. So this is this study, continuing. Now the news, Merck news first. There's a news, uh, Merck drug less effective against moderate COVID, India regulatory source. And this is by writers. Makes sense. So my comment here, and it is actually, it makes sense. This is the same thing for remdesivir as well. And that is the following. Look. And you would probably like this, that I don't fall into trap of uh, becoming groups of anti-vax group, pro-vax group, anti-mask, pro-mask, and now anti molnupiravir pro molnupiravir I really feel bad that ivermectin had been in the latest few weeks in a campaigned, orchestrated way, bad-mouthed. And I think that was probably a preparation to get this drug out in the market. Having said that, look, any antiviral will only be effective when the virus is present. So if we are talking about moderate, these patients who are in the hospital who are moderate, they may actually not be that much viral and they may be more cytokine. And if that is the case, then yeah, antiviral will not work on them. So this is not a ding on the drug. It's just an understanding of where the drug may help. It is an antiviral. It's going to help more on the viral phase. So when you see these new cycles, please be aware it's not just this that hit the drug has failed. Now, it will be interesting to see in the mild cases and in the prophylaxis, and as they claim they're doing a test on transmission control, what is the actual data? What do they show us? Because this drug has been, molnupiravir has been out there since 2014. So what is the side effects? What is the efficacy? We still have to see that, the data itself. But this kind of a new cycle should not start us in a in a state of worry so i just want to quickly show you this so this is the merck drug less effective against moderate covid 19 india regulatory source is it uh, me who thinks that just before the molnupiravir news had started or had to start other things started getting for example, India said, don't use ivermectin anymore. Or Australia said, let's ban ivermectin. Or BBC writes this seething article about it. Is there a 
campaign. There, there's a campaign here in the U.S. for for sure. The comedy channels and the mainstream channels they just started attacking uh, ivermectin and calling it horse space. They forgot that this has helped river blindness and it has helped so many people with the worms and so on and it has been protective, very very protective. Anyways, that's a different discussion. Here is the writer saying. And and did you see that I've changed my pronunciation from routers to writers? I hope I'm getting closer to the right pronunciation. So experimental antiviral drug molnupiravir has not shown significant efficacy against moderate COVID-19, a source with drug controller general India said. And this is an anonymous kind of a report. And we should be less worried at this time because ideally it should not be for moderate. Although if you look at Merck's uh, data that I sh uh, shared that day, they call it from mild to moderate, four mild to moderate. If they put both of them, then I would say that there would be a smaller proportion of moderate that would be helped with it, not everyone. And on technical grounds, those people who have virus still present, and there are so many ads here, virus still present, then they would be helped. And those who do not have virus present, they would not be. So then two Indian drug makers to end trials of generic Merck pill for moderate. So once again, there are two drug makers who were working on the uh, trial with Merck on this. And they said, hey, we're not seeing much benefit with the moderate. So let's stop that. Well, makes sense. Continuing. Continuing with the news. Then there is another news from April that is now becoming surfaced. And I want to make sure once again, we don't fall in the trap of that. That is also that, hey, Merck did not see the uh, benefit in hospitalized patients. So they stopped that part of the uh, trial and they continued with the mild to moderate. So in one way, it is understandable. There is a kind of a uh, interesting thing as well that I want to uh, share. So let's look at this first. Again, this is news. So here, and news has all those um possibilities of you know not the most accurate um, reporting merck plans large outpatient trial of covid-19 pill stop study in hospitalized patient this is april 15 april 15 so this is we're talking october now what is happening here is understandable that merck would once again would have seen that hey it doesn't work on hospitalized moderate towards severe because there is no virus there and they stopped it. The only question that I have is, was this part of the trial, part of the phase two and three that they just reported, or was that a separate trial? If it was part of two and three, which I do not know, if it was part of two and three, then just like they have this objection on ivermectin type studies to say, they changed the, the method in, in the middle. Then if they, molnupiravir had a similar thing, then they changed the met method in the middle. But if these were two separate plans and separate trials, and then they abandoned one trial, that is fine. That simply means that they're saying, hey, this is not useful in this area. So again, I don't have enough data. And that is generally a problem as well, that we are moving towards getting an EUA very soon. And here is a drug with so much ambiguous data around it. So much unknowns around it and still moving forward towards the approval. Anyways, um, as I've said before, the drug seems to be a good drug. Efficacy, even 50% protection towards uh, efficacy and then protection from death is useful. For humanity, it is useful. So uh, politics and economics and the um, leanings and biases and influences aside, if drug is useful, we'll use it. Okay, so now next part. The next part. So <laughs> I put my cartoon back here. Okay, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Scan Scandinavian countries, they are limiting the use of Moderna. So it is an interesting situation. Limiting the use of Moderna, then they're left with Pfizer. And if Pfizer continues to insist, as I discussed yesterday, that hey, our, uh, our vaccines have waning antibodies. And by the way, we talked about that yesterday. It is not a problem. But if they take that as an excuse to say, we want to sell boosters, then probably we should turn the tables on them and say, well, it looks like your 
product is not good enough go make it better i know that it's already fine and they are using it to sell but they need to stop doing that so here sweden denmark and finland have paused moderna or limited moderna usage for 30 years and under for folks after 1990 who were born 1991 and after 30 years and citing myocarditis pericarditis sweden and denmark had done that then finland joined as well and i think it's going to spread and this is uh, once again this is after the second after the second shot and i know that there is a um i know that there is a continuous messaging out there that this is something to do with the intravenous injection so i don't think this is entirely intravenous injection issue um there are so many theories formed i feel bad that when somebody wants to just start focusing on their own making themselves correct then they start making theories that may not be for example the youngsters are more exercising people and because of that their veins are harder and thicker and bigger and that is why the needle goes into their veins more easily than others um then why the first shot versus second shot anyways there are many many ambiguities so these countries they just took a different route instead of saying intravenous not intravenous they simply said we will not give it to 30 and under so they so let's say there is a thing with intravenous fine at least what they are doing is they're saying we're going to just limit this and reduce the possibility to this it is interesting to see moderna's response so what do you think would be the response i think we have become used to knowing what the responses will be what do you think i had highlighted that response somewhere what happened <laughs> the, the, these news things are just nothing but continuous um, ads so the response was i think here anyways the the response was that most of the youngsters they they become good on their own number one and number two the risk of cardiac inflammation because of covid is more than the vaccine i always feel that that is an easy way out we should once we acknowledge that hey this can happen then we can take we have choices of vaccines we have choices of uh, therapies so then we can figure out ways and algorithms to handle this situation but if we ignore it then we're not going to get ready to prepare for to handle it anyway so that is that continuing on to the next one the last part of the topic uh, topics today last topic quercetin and thyroid so this has been a discussion for some days that does quercetin cause hypothyroid or if somebody is hypothyroid does it make it worse and so on so i wanted to make sure that we uh, look at it so first let's look at some studies here is the drugs.com and in the drugs.com there is this interaction synthyroid or levothyroxin and quercetin and their interaction when you look for that they say no drug interactions found although they give messages about about levothyroxine so that is one at least from interaction point of view one of the interaction checking system says no interaction one second here is a study the study is on rats cells in vitro so this is not a study in vivo inside the rat or inside a human it is cells that are sort of human like cells taken from rat put them in a dish and then work on them so that means how pertinent is this to humans it may not be number 1 number 2 i would give us this caution that if quercetin somehow was able to cause hypothyroid then it would have already become controlled or 
cautions were given and so on. But here is a study where they show that it can interfere with thyroid function. And I'm going to explain how that happens according to this study. So in this study, what they say is the following. So imagine this is a thyroid, thyroid gland cell. This, this whole thing is a cell. On the cell, just like other cells, insulin will come in and help with the cell function or energy formation, carbohydrates entering the cell, becoming ATP. In addition to that, insulin can connect with the RTK receptors, which would cause inositol, phospho, phosphatidyl inositol triphosphate or PIP3 enzyme mechanisms to become active. This is, for our discussion, you can think of this that insulin com comes in, this is the doorbell, this is the doorbell, and then inside the house, there are a bunch of people who are going to respond to the bell. So these are called second messenger systems or second messengers. These second messengers are of various kinds. Here, the kind that we are interested in is the PIP3. That kind of the second messenger works with many, many parts of the cellular enzymes, many cellular enzymes. One of those enzymes is the AKT enzyme. AKT in enzyme, in turn, is responsible for cell growth, cell nourishment, cell differentiation, cells function, and so on. Now, quercetin blocks this pathway. Now, how much block? If it just totally blocks it, then we would become hypothyroid with quercetin and we'll, we'll have serious problem. So it disrupts that pathway to some extent. And you can see that not enough extent that it is still over the counter. But it disrupts that in those in vitro rat cells. It did that. It disrupts this pathway, which means that AKT-based thyroid hormones and thyroid cell growth, so thyroid cell uh, replication and function is reduced by quercetin. The study then they said, hey, we have found this mechanism. It is insulin-related cell growth disruption. And this may be a useful mechanism to study further to see if quercetin can become a useful drug for causing hypothyroid or for helping with hyperthyroid situation. Not causing hypothyroid, but somebody who is hyperthyroid, it would help them bring their hyperthyroid back towards normal. I think that this has, uh, the study, if you look at it, the study is 2007. Do you see here? So 2007 study, if there was much merit in this kind of a thing, then there would have been more studies or the quercetin-like drugs would have been used as hypothyroid drugs as well. So at least from this study, it does not look like quercetin is a potent hypothyroid causing drugs. And so let me just very quickly, in this report, we show that quercetin inhibits thyroid cell growth in association with inhibition of insulin modulated phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase AKT kinase activity. That's the enzyme system I just showed. Then down here, they say once again, quercetin inhibition of growth appears to involve an effect on insulin signaling. The data raises the possibility that quercetin may be a novel disruptor of thyroid function, which has potential effect on or use in the therapy of thyroid diseases. This has not yet fully gotten into the endocrinology to say use quercetin. There are some more data points I have over here, and these links are in the description. So what is this enzyme if you wanted to see in the enzyme system, then you can look at this one. Here is another uh, quercetin activates hyperthyroidism induced liver damage, sorry, alleviates liver damage via NRF2 signaling pathway. So that is another, the flavonoid quercetin regulates growth and gene expression in the rat. It's the same one I just went over. 
and then phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase AKT pathway in human cancers. So that pathway takes part in that as well. So I have all those links so that um, if somebody wants to look at them, they can. So this is the discussion for today. I thought it would be two minutes per topic and will be done in 12 minutes, but here we are. So I hope it makes sense. Uh, how about we do the talk in the chit chat? So please do me a favor. What? <laughs> Jason Carter. He, he's a puppet by the government, paid puppet by the spread, promote, and gen paid. There is no payments. And uh, I think this is the problem that some folks just do not understand that what is the value of learning mechanisms, understanding studies, and thinking. So anyways, with this, please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> like, like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee, or you can be a patron, or you can use PayPal to support this work. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back in a few minutes, and we will talk more.